Well, welcome to Real Talk with Jordan Riley, where the real talk does not come from me. It comes directly from God's Word. And before we get started today, please consider subscribing to our channel, giving this a thumbs up, and supporting what we do by going to realtalkwithjordan.com. On today's episode, I'm going to expose four things that may be wrecking your faith today. This episode is vital for all Christians to watch because I believe it could be something that you're struggling with today and don't even know it. So are you ready? Let's go. Does a man get a one night stand? Repent and believe the gospel. You don't need, to, you don't need no one night stand, you need Jesus, man. Fair enough. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Tonight, God calls you to be saved. Be reconciled. Well, I know that opening video may have shocked you a little bit, but I wanna do something a little different today. I wanna to have some real talk. See, many people inside the church have been having their faith wrecked and either don't realize it or don't know how to fix it and we need to talk about it. In order to deal with this, I need to be able to tell you the truth and it may step on some of your toes, but if we don't acknowledge the junk in our lives, how will we ever get victory over it? The Bible says in Jeremiah 17 verse nine, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Now, clearly only God can do that. But the big point that I want to really drive home today is that our hearts are sick and sinful. And if we look to the wrong things in our life, we will absolutely wreck our faith and we will be in the ditch before we know it. See, there are tons of worldly influences that want to deceive us and want us to accept them rather than obey what God says. So as we get started, I want to ask each and every one of you guys a question, and that's this. Is Jesus truly the answer to this life? Now, before you get all church and you're like, amen, preach it, Jordan, that's it, you're speaking it, that's yeah, fire. No, come on, wait until I fully break it down. And before we get to the four things that really wreck our faith, I want to focus on a certain text, and that's Colossians chapter 2, verse 3. It says, To whom are hidden the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, if you back up a verse into verse 2, you'll see who Paul is talking about. He's referring to Jesus, who has all wisdom and knowledge. But the question still remains, do you believe this? If you do, this will help you from going off the rails and drifting away from Jesus. So Paul then says in verse four that he is sharing this to keep us from falling victim to persuasive arguments. And now he will go and expose four things that can shipwreck our faith. And that's what I wanna share with you today. So let's get started. Number one, philosophy. Let's look at Colossians chapter two, verse eight. It says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. So right there out of the gate, Paul is warning us about things that may take us captive. And what does he say it is? Philosophy, empty deception, and the traditions of men. So what do you mean by philosophy? Watch this. If you've ever wondered whether God exists, whether life has purpose, whether beauty is in the eye of the beholder, what makes actions right or wrong, or whether a law is fair or just, then you've thought about philosophy. But what is philosophy? The question is itself a philosophical question. One, defining philosophy. The most general definition of philosophy is that it is the pursuit of wisdom, truth, and knowledge. Indeed, the word itself means love of wisdom in Greek. Whenever people think about deep, fundamental questions concerning the nature of the universe and ourselves, the limits of human knowledge, their values, and the meaning of life, they are thinking about philosophy. So philosophy, in essence, is human understanding. It's the search for truth, and it's always based on what we think. Now break that down, let's have some real talk. Philosophy, in essence, is our opinions. And last time I checked, there is not one verse in the Bible that says we are to trust our opinions. Paul was a very scholarly man, and he said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. So Paul made it clear 
that his understanding and his opinions and his education were nothing compared to knowing Christ. And do you notice the word he used there? He says rubbish. That's what I read in my translation. But other translations uh, use that word poop or dung. Think about that a second. I also want you to see that King Solomon, who was the wisest man on earth, shared this very same sentiment. He wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, And I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. It is a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men to be afflicted with. I have seen all the works which have been done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and striving after wind. See, human wisdom always undermines faith. We can search our whole life for the meaning of life and for our purpose. But in every question we have, you have to know that Jesus has the answer. Colossians chapter 2 verse 10 says that we are complete in Christ. And 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 3 says that Christ is simple and not complex. And John chapter 14 verse 6 says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, it's not what's in your head that's the truth. Jesus is absolute truth and his word is absolute truth. Sadly, we live in a postmodern culture that has wrecked a lot of people's faith and exchanged it for human opinion. Of your truth. This has become one of the most popular phrases in today's culture. It comes from the postmodernist movement. It means that the truth is relative or subjective. So whatever you think is true, that's true. Now, the objective truth, which is true outside of what your opinion is, that is no longer a reality to the postmodernist. Now, obviously, this is a very dangerous mentality, and it's especially conflicting with the Christian worldview. So, obviously, God would be the objective source of truth, henceforth the clashing between Christians and postmodernists. So, we see a lot of Christians starting to move over to the postmodernist view, saying that that's compatible with Christianity. Well, my message to you Christians, it is not compatible with postmodernism. God is the objective source of truth no matter what your opinion is. Now, I want you to really pay attention because the Bible calls our opinions elementary principles. And if you really look at that, in essence, Paul is saying that is baby talk. Goo goo gaga. Goo goo gaga. That's what our opinions are. Think about that a second. But if you want divine truth, you don't go to people and get opinions. You go to God and his word to get the truth. Number two is external legalistic religion. Look at Colossians chapter two, verses 16 and 17. It says, therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So you see right there in those verses that Paul is addressing external acts of legalism. But what is legalism? Watch this. So what is legalism? Legalism is substituting faith for rules. It can be about a religion instead of a relationship. It gets the focus off of God and what he has done for you and instead what you do for God. God doesn't need you to do anything for him, but he has done it all for you. And that's the problem with legalism. Being legalistic really is a killjoy. So here's a safeguard. Live each day by grace. See, grace is the key to joy. Everything God has done in you and through you is by grace. You don't work for it. You don't earn it. And once you understand that you, everything you have, everything God has placed within you is done by grace, then you can relax and enjoy what it is God has given you. So when you look at legalism and what Paul is trying to get at, you see that legalism is always consumed with details and it's concerned with do's and don'ts. But if we realize that we are complete in Christ and that Jesus completed the requirements that we could not complete, then we don't have to be consumed with the details. Legalism always works hard to do things in our strength which is totally worthless, by the way. 
Isaiah 64 verse 6 says that our good deeds are filthy rags before God. Legalism also believes that we play a role in our salvation. Absolutely not. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 and John chapter 3 verses 3 through 8, just to name a few, says that we play no role in our salvation. Legalism also seeks to take credit for our religious activities. So let's sum it all up. Legalism is external actions done by us that we think will gain us favor with God or will save us. And if you believe what I just said, then you are not a Christian and you are not saved because you cannot save yourself. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And I hope you see that external religion always puts the focus on what we do rather than resting in what Jesus did. This means that we are also adding to the gospel, saying that what Jesus did on the cross was not enough to save us. We've got to add our efforts. Number three is mysticism, which we can find in Colossians chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. It says, let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of the angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the entire body, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with a growth which is from God. Wow, did you hear what I just read? Paul was saying that you are deceived if you think Jesus isn't enough, but you need to add things like tongues or visions or dreams or experiences. I mean, come on, you guys, that is mysticism. And if you don't understand it, let me share with you a little more. Mysticism is a deeper, higher religious experience based on personal intuition. Did you get that? Mysticism is a deeper, higher religious experience based on personal intuition. You know what it really is? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Mysticism is nothing. It's just something you think is something. It is not what you think it is. And yet people think it is what they think it is. Sadly, many people think that they need to have special experiences to gain access to God or to get closer to Him. That is absolutely unbiblical. If you look at it, it's all based on feelings or the things that you have done. And what does that lead to? Let's have some, again, real talk. It leads to pride because you had a so-called experience and I didn't. So you're a better Christian than me. You love Jesus more. He loves you more. Come on, you guys. What does the Bible say? Does the Bible say that we are to live by experience? No, not at all. Romans chapter 1 verse 17 says the righteous will live by faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7 says that we walk by faith and not by sight. Number four is asceticism or self-abasement. Look at Colossians chapter 2 verses 20 through 23. It says, if you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. So what is self-abasement? That's when someone deprives himself of things to try to earn favor with God or think that their guilt will go away or think that they will look holy to others around them. And let me be very clear. God is not impressed and God is not moved by you depriving yourself of things. A modern example is Lent. Catholics think that by going without something for 40 days, that they will gain favor with God or be more like Jesus. And that's simply not true. Jesus actually rebuked the Pharisees in Matthew 6, verses 16 through 18, who fasted and went without things to seem extra spiritual and gain the praise and adoration of others. Now, if you look at the four things that I mentioned today, you will see that Jesus truly is not sufficient in all these four things. And that people, by using and relying on these four things, are adding to the gospel and adding to the finished work of Jesus on the cross. None of these things save 
anybody. And none of these things will gain you one ounce of favor with God because it is simply works-based righteousness that relies on what you've done rather than what the Lord has done. And let me be very clear, the gospel is not about you and me, it's about Jesus.